All right, all right. We are live, folks, on the Ujima Hour. Welcome to the Ujima Hour. I am Michael Tekken Strode of the Colonel Nut Collaborative. Um, thank you all for joining me on uh, yet another broadcast here on the Ujima Hour, uh, where we are satiating our curiosity for all things uh, Black and social and solidarity economy um, through intimate and formal conversation. Um, we are exploring on this broadcast different ways that um, that that artists and creators and and um, and entrepreneurs and just folks are engaging in this conversation around economy in new and different ways, new and dynamic ways. Um, since we began this broadcast back in 2018, uh, we have spoken to a range of different voices, uh, academics uh, here in UIC and uh, John Marshall Law School. We've spoken to folks who are building cooperative federations uh, down in Austin, Texas. Folks who um, who, are, who are engaging in uh, cooperative developments in Philadelphia. We've spoken to folks who are engaging in the, the Oakland Black Business District and the revitalization of the artistic scene there uh, using cooperative models. So all of these different ways that uh, communities are conceiving and developing uh, these, uh, these social and solidarity economy projects and initiatives, um, we've been able to engage on this broadcast um, and, you know, we, we thank you for taking this journey with us. Um, again, you know, this, uh, as, as I've said often, this was a space where I was attempting to satisfy my own, my own curiosity and to bring some of these conversations that I was having in some of these different spaces into uh, the public view um, outside, of, uh, outside of the sort of intimate context of just a sort of face-to-face -face dialogue. Um, but, you know, in, the, in that process, in that process of documenting these conversations and, and publicizing these conversations, archiving these conversations, um, there's something that we've learned about the ways that, that communities are organizing. There's something that we have learned about the approaches that communities are taking to developing organizational governance, to the approaches that communities are taking to even in this moment, we're in this moment of where, where mutual aid is sort of at its highest peak in terms of people uh, are finding new definition and finding new ways to engage. Um, in this moment, we are seeing communities take care of one another in, 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 in ways that, um, that perhaps there are generations who have not seen uh, this sort of level of, of mass, um, mass empathy break, you know, broken out, right? Um, but these are ways that, that organizations that have been documented on this broadcast have been doing ongoing work um, in terms of engaging their communities, in terms of mobilizing their communities, in terms of activating and organizing their communities. Uh, so that's what we do on this Ujima Hour broadcast um, every, uh, every month. Uh, so we hit the second Monday of every month at uh, 7.30 p.m. And we have a new guest every single month. You know, we have a new conversation every single month where we, again, engaging and dialoguing around these issues. So we are in... Um, we are in a moment. We are in a COVID-19 moment. Um, I, we were just entering this moment uh, during the last month's broadcast. So, you know, we had two guests last month. Uh, we spoke initially with uh, Damon Williams of the Let Us Breathe Collective on a regular uh, second Monday event. Um, and, and that was right at the, the sort of launch of their Freetown 2020 initiative. Uh, so if you're not in the Freetown 2020 uh, Monday visioning sessions, I would highly recommend them, um, you know, they, they may not, certain, no one is going to be able to get outdoors and, and, and do the things that they, that they wanted to do um, in uh, the, the ways that they wanted to do it this spring and in the summer. Um, but certainly they are doing some online uh, work, you know, in terms of their micro granting, their stimulus package for humanity that, um, that, that, is, that is noble and that is imaginative. And it's a, it's a way to connect and engage community um, in this space that we are in right now, in this context that we are in right now, where uh, where we can, you know, we are we are told to physically distance ourselves from one another, um, how do we continue to keep that imagination going on what the future looks like for us in our communities, um, in in that space and in that context? So um, yeah, so so last month we talked to uh, Damon Williams initially, uh, but then we had a special edition episode where you uh, saw me talking to Chinyere Ote of Cowrie Collective uh, out of St. Louis, and um, and there was a there was a bit of dejection on my part and during that conversation because we were just entering this moment and I I was experiencing a, a moment of grief right um, so the moment of grief is the the sort of grieving it's it's. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, you, you used to, on Tumblr, they used to have um, that, that, um, that Tumblr that was devoted to words that, that, you know, do not exist in language, you know, so they had these words that, you know, there's an emotion and it should have a language to it, right? 
what is the language, what is the word that describes the grief that you have for the year that did not happen? <laughs> Um, you know, so that, 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 that's a mind exercise, you know, but effectively that's the state of emotion that I was in when I talked to Chinyure. Um, I was having a moment of grief for a year that would not occur right now. I did not know how much of that year would not occur. Um, you know, there, there were lots of summits and lots of conferences and lots of gatherings that were canceled. Um, and th these were things that, that I was highly excited about because, you know, the cola nut, you know, it was prominent in these spaces. Um, and, and the second moment of grief, the second part of that grief, so not only was it a grief for the actual year that was not occurring, but it was grieving for the fact that in this moment, when the collaborative infrastructure that, that the Kola Nut imagines, you know, providing to communities would be at its, at its most useful, it wasn't ready, right? It wasn't ready to actually capture and, 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 and hold that space. Um, so, so there was a lot of grief in that, 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 first, uh, that first week, in those first two weeks. Um, fortunate enough, there were, was also a lot of momentum and, and mobilizing amongst um, activists and artist communities throughout the country. And um, a lot of these gatherings that I have, I've yearned to be in, you know, but I was not in that state. I was not in that city. I was not in that locale. Um, a lot of these gatherings that I've yearned to attend I was able to attend over the course of that, that following week and the following two weeks, you know, that, that uh, allowed me to connect with folks um, throughout the nation. Um, so there, there, were, there were the Highland of Mutual Aid gatherings, um, of history and principles and how to's. Um, there there were, were um, all sorts of gatherings with the New Economy Coalition. So we had our educators working group, you know, that, that met up. Um, there, there was a um, some of the policy, you know, groups got together and, and, and proposed webinars. So there were just there was all this activity and and um, the opportunity to connect in deeper and meaningful ways with folks who are not native to the sort of Chicago context, who are not here in the in the, in the context of Chicago, um, was a rejuvenating factor in helping me to overcome the grief. Um, and certainly, there were also opportunities to connect more deeply to people who are here in Chicago. So, um, you know, one of the things that I've been sharing um, recently around the Cold Nut Collaborative um, is just that, um, and in fact, I'm realizing that, uh, okay, well, I'll figure that part out later. Um, yeah, that, that, that emblem is not there in the corner where it should be. But one of the things that I've been talking to uh, several groups around the Cold Nut Collaborative about is that... Um, you know, my, my phone's sort of been ringing off the hook with people just kind of trying to figure out um, how to engage this offers and needs market um, and to, to really get people in deeper conversation around the, the asset mapping strategies um, that, that we have been talk, speaking towards. Um, because there's th that, that, is, that, is the, that is the yearning, that is the activity that, that is driving lots of, uh, lots of the mutual aid network work, right? Um, everybody's got a spreadsheet. Every neighborhood's got a spreadsheet. Um, and, and there's all this matching that's going on. Um, the challenge that I've placed and, you know, the challenge that I continue to speak to with, um, you know, spaces like the, the Chicago Urban Permaculture Salon, the, the Black Oaks Permaculture, Permaculture Guild, um, you know, the, the Co-op for Lib uh, core team, you know, is, is about making sure that the, the infrastructure that is set up around these, uh, this work um, is something that is continuous. So that, that's, that's always my concern, you know, making sure that um, as we are developing these opportunities and spaces for collaboration, do we have an infrastructure that can continue on after this particular moment passes? Um, are we prepared for that? Are we thinking that far ahead? Um, and it's very challenging in the moment when there's direct need, when there's first response. Um, but we have to take a moment and we have to pause and we have to reflect and then we have to leap ahead even in the moment where we feel like um, the immediate thing is the immediate thing, right? The immediate need that is here is what we are attendant to. Um, but can we imagine that there's something on the other side and can we do the work to make sure that we are prepared to have an infrastructure that lives on the other side of this moment? Um, so, you know, um, shout out to some of my folks who've been posting that beyond COVID-19 hashtag. 
uh, just recognizing that, you know, beyond this moment, beyond this crisis, um, there is no new normal. Um, there's something else. There's, there's some, you know, there's some, some greater opportunity for us. There's something more for us to engage in. Um, do we have the capacity to imagine that deeply, that broadly, that widely? Um, I hope we do. And I have, I have faith in us, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that we have the capacity to do that. And we shall, we shall. Um, so this is the Ujima Hour. Um, I'm Michael Tekenstrode of the Coldernut Collaborative. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the Coldernut Collaborative, the Coldernut Collaborative is presently Chicago's, um, um, Chicago's only uh, time and skills sharing exchange. Um, or, or, or skill skill sharing exchange uh, based on time. Uh, so if folks have the opportunity to engage in the Colonet Collaborative, to join the Colonet Collaborative, post the things that they're looking for, um, you know, things that they're willing to offer to other people in exchange and trade for time, um, post the things that they need, you know, find the things that they're looking for that they need in their lives, um, again, in exchange for time. Uh, and hopefully what we're doing is we're incentivizing new forms of participation inside of our community. We're bringing new people into the space of community. Um, one of the things that Shinyure and I talked about on, on our, our interview was um, the uh, tremendous capacity that is required to, to cultivate and build an infrastructure like a time bank. And the, the great challenge um, with, with, with lots of forms of organizing, lots of organizing spaces, that um, the people who show up to the space um, to build the space, to, to, to erect the space, to hold up the space, are often the same people. And um, if we don't have a strategy to make sure that we're rotating um, people into spaces um, in, in a way that, 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 is, that is nourishing, that is rejuvenating, that is life-giving, that is life-sustaining, um, then ultimately, um, you know, I, 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 I think we are in for, and, and, I'll, and I'll give the metaphor that I gave to on a call this week, you know, I, I foresee a tremendous amount of slack depth. And by that, I mean, there are so many slack instances that have popped up. And there's so many Slack instances that are to be abandoned. Um, I, and I know because I am part of several Slack instances that have been abandoned. Um, and I end up being the sort of last person around there, you know, with the echoes. But um, yeah, so, so, so again, how we use infrastructure, the type of infrastructure we use and the things that we choose to, to, um, um, to, to do, do our organizing within, the, the sort of frameworks that we use. Um, are really critical, are really important, and you know, um, I, 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 I lean on us to be thoughtful and to be intentional, um, to really think about and be mindful of, of what that infrastructure is, um, what choices we make around it. Um, you know, one text that I picked up this week, you know, and um, I, I certainly should have prepared my now reading list, but um, I picked up the Trade School uh, 2009 to 2019 publication. Um, by Caroline Woodard, Woolard. Um, now, she's not the only author there. It's a compilation of different works. But Trade School um, is an initiative um, that was born in, in New York. Um, but it was born, uh, and, and you know, um, the Chicago connection is that Trade School was founded on mess hall principles. And for folks, you know, who um, are familiar with the mess hall in Rogers Park, it was a collaborative, experimental, um, artistic, and creative space. Um, so, you know, Chicago mess hall principals travel to Newark and trade school becomes a space where people are bartering for education. So you have a skill that you can teach. You have a skill that you can share with other people. Um, we're going to set up an exchange where people who want to attend that class, they bring they bring something that you need. You, you put out a list of needs. You say, these are the things that I'm looking for. Um, here's what I'm willing to teach. If you would like to attend, fulfill one of these needs. So there's that bartering and there's that exchange for education. Um, so trade school launches in in, uh, in 2009 in um, in New York, and I, I think it was there was another project preceding that, you know. But um, that's the sort of framework of the tech 2009 to 2019. But it ends up traveling all over the world. It travels to Singapore, you know. It comes over to Indianapolis, you know. There was a trade school Evanston uh, at one point, you know, that was associated with the Chicago Time Exchange. Um, so, you know, again, you know, um, I, but I was looking at that publication um, and the reason I'm referencing it is because um, basically at the sort of end of life of uh, the of trade school, um, trade school Indianapolis, trade school Indy was the last last trade school standing. 
Um, and the challenge was they had this one programmer that, you know, that, that was programming the site, that was maintaining the site. And basically, you know, it was trying to find funding, scrounge up funding to pay this programmer to continue building on the site so that one trade school could, you know, continue its life. Um, and, and perhaps we, again, you know, being thoughtful about our infrastructure, being thoughtful about how we're using technology in, in our in organizing and making sure that um, we, ha we, we are thinking about continuity, um, I think is going to benefit us in the long run. That's my rant. Um, so I you all for joining me on this conversation. Um, and I appreciate what is about to happen in this dialogue. Um, so let me just organize myself here. Because there are windows abound. Yes. So tonight um, we have a very special guest. You know, I'm I'm delighted to to uh, be joined here tonight by uh, Maida Teresa McNeil, Maida Teresa McNeil, uh, director of Honey Pop Performance, uh, Afrofeminist Collective, dedicated to critical performance and public humanities. Um, you know, I remember. Um, the first performance I saw was Sweet Goddess Project. And, you know, I was so deeply impressed. And at the time I was still writing on my blog, The Literate Epoch. Um, and so, you know, I ended up doing a write-up of the of that piece, both for my Literate Epoch and my Tumblr blog. Um, but I was just, I was so excited and engaged um, about these, the level of energy that was brought to the performance and to the floor. Um, and that, that it, it felt like, um, and, 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 and all, all the performances since then have, have been uh, similar you know, it felt like being in the scene, right? It felt like being in the space. There was actually a sort of conversation that, and an interplay that was happening um, between my body and my, my desire to move um, and the performance at hand. Um, so uh, director of Honey Pot Performance, um, recently establishing this, uh, this Fifth City project, which I'm very anxious to, to talk about, to revisit it. Um, so we'll look forward to that. But Honey Pot Performance has also been responsible for the Chicago Black Social, Cult Social Culture Map, uh, Ways of Knowing, um, and, and made a, you know, in her spare time, <laughs> uh, as the arts and culture manager supporting the Chicago Park District Community Arts Partnerships. Uh, so there will be lots of conversation about that. Um, so opening up the channel now, let's go ahead and bring Maida into the conversation. Well, welcome, Maida. Absolutely. Yes, we are delighted to have you on the broadcast. Um, yeah, so, so um, you know, I, I always try to give people uh, space in the beginning to kind of give um, their bio, give their background or give their story in whatever way you want to contain it. Um, but bring us from where you came from, your point of origin up to now um, in, in, in whatever way is meaningful to you. Um, that I,
Yes, yes. Um, so driving to maybe um, one of the more direct questions of the broadcast, you know, what are the ways that you have thought about it, it, the, the interaction of economy within your work? Um, as you, you, you've charted, um, you, you, you've explored, you've done the anthropology, you've done, um, you, you've studied this, uh, the, the sort of social culture and, and dynamics. What are the ways that, that you felt like there's been overlaps with the uh, economy in your work? Um, you know, one of the, the um, impressions that I draw from participating in the, 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 the mapping, Chicago mapping sessions, um, participating in some of the ways of knowing uh, community gatherings um, are just a, a, a really important, um, important way that you, you, you think about exchange. So when you are developing these, these performances um, for within within honeypot and, and and even within fifth city um how are you thinking about um the use of the community as an archive that you're drawing from to kind of you know create these these experiences or create these stories
Um. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh. no. Yeah, I'm just still. Okay. Still okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, entries about all of those spaces. Um, and then we. And so, um, switching uh, switching a sort of slight gear, um, your work with the uh, the park district. Um, what's the relationship of cultural stewardship to the the sort of way the the path you choose in terms of art making? And when you sort of think of that framework of cultural stewardship, what's what are the in those two spaces? Let's see. And imagining myself as a future leader, right? Um, and thinking about the work, uh, the what I'm learning as I do, as I as I'm uh, as I'm having uh, joy and fun and playing, experience, experimenting and being exposed to new kinds of um, things in the parks. That those are also making you know those young folks. Um, participatory, civic-minded individuals, you know, um, and, and really trying to tie that to creativity. Uh, I would say similarly in the work that my team does with kind of cultural partnership 
work, whether that is um, these arts partners and residents and supporting like 30 some odd small companies around the city who are embedded and um, at parks to um, the 15 cultural centers that we support around the city with some enhanced programming and trying to just attract more resources um, to those spaces to benefit communities. That work, again, is about this kind of civic-minded um, work that is, you know, that every neighborhood should, neighborhood should have accessible, quality, cultural programming that those who live in those neighborhoods, and how can we support um, bringing, you know, uh, not just the direct resources, but the skill sharing, the um, knowledge that people need to have to be able to kind of um, programs or think about what it takes to build a partnership in uh, a park setting to be able to, to kind of bring that education. Um, so I think that's a lot of the ways we're thinking about stewardship um, in, in a parks context. Um, and, and actually thinking about culture and creativity as part of that holistic experience, um, you know, of things that should be offered to humans, you know, who, who have access to these spaces. Um, yeah. Um, in your view, what's the relationship between um, cultural stewardship and community self-determination? What's the interaction between those two spaces? Mm. So I, I heard you say the civic mindedness around the youth. Are you yeah. People? Yeah. Um, do you see yeah. I mean, I think that, that, yeah, I think that relates to people, you know, in these, you know, we've got 77 different <laughs> community areas, you know, and I think that you have 77 plus more, you know, it, it's uh, exponentially multiplying these visions of what people imagine for their communities and their, their neighborhoods. Can Lena reconnect? All right, folks. Idea of you know how community self determination or um, um, yeah fits into this idea of stewardship, right? So, uh, pardon, there was uh, a, a brief break in a connection here, which uh, yeah. I think was causing some issues with, with, with receiving your answer. So, uh, you know, uh, feel free to fill us in on any part that the technology <laughs> fractured for us. Um, yeah. <laughs> cool. I think I was just, to quickly summarize, I think I was just saying that um, – I think that there, you know, we have a, an incredibly diverse city uh, with a lot of different visions and ideas about uh, what a community or any one community should have or have access to or can imagine. And that we're trying to create, as you were mentioning at the beginning of uh, this hour, talking about building, you know, the appropriate infrastructures to support, you know, uh, an idea or a vision or imagination. Um, I think that we're trying to, my team is really trying to imagine what, you know, what is for us, what is this infrastructure that we are trying to um, uphold and create so that uh, anyone uh, in any community who is interacting with the park space has, has a set of guidelines, had a, has a set of resources to kind of um, help them think about uh how they can imagine things differently in that space, right? Or, you know, so how they think about um, 
again, to this idea of stewardship and kind of volunteering and uh, supporting these, you know, public spaces, but giving them access to resources uh, around um, event and program planning or relationship building or fundraising um, or even kind of marketing and communications to help think about how you, you know, get the word out uh, about things. I think that those things that infrastructure building is really key to uh, helping uh, a community realize the things that it that it wants to realize, right? Not not us saying these are the things you should have, but if there are things that you want to do, you need the skills to be able to implement those things, right? And we're trying to think within a specific park context, what are the things that we can help put in place so then people have access to that knowledge and those resources then to be able to make those things happen, right? Yes, yes. Um, so that situates us very well to um, get into the topic of Fifth City. Um, so, you know, give us a, 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 I mean, I know the archives are massive, you know, <laughs> um, in terms of what I see has available there, but give us a bit of background on what Fifth City um, was, is, um, you know, however you frame it. I, I know that I, I have a sort of archive of projects that I'm just like are permanently tabled. Red Bike is <laughs> never gone. Boltonia is never gone. It's just <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> so, um, Yeah, I mean, so, you know, it was uh, Fifth City uh, began in the 60s um, and was this kind of radical community experiment um, from the 60s to, I would say, like the late 80s, early 90s. Um, it was when it was really in it, you know, moving, um, and was about, uh, in many ways, community self determination. Yes. From the uh, Ecumenical Institute, um, uh, branched off from the Methodist Church, came and uh, were living in the community, uh, connected with community residents. Uh, uh, around, um, you know, what their their challenges and issues were um, and began meeting with them weekly on Tuesday nights um, in these small groups to kind of just over time problem solve together. Like, you know, what are all the issues and then how do we begin to create plans to solve those things? Um, and so it can be, you know, things as mundane as kind of like, community cleanup days and, you know, picking up trash to building playgrounds and beautification. Uh, they had a whole series of mural projects they did to then growing to things that were much more ambitious, like creating a preschool, um, which continues to stand today, uh, affordable housing. They bought a number of buildings and rehabbed them um, in the area. Um, and then built a whole series um, of kind of black owned businesses, a community center uh, that was all about kind of housing this vision of uh, a fifth city where the, the, the citizens of that city, uh, that neighborhood were making the decisions about their future, right? And creating the positive uh, future that they wanted for themselves by relying on themselves. Um, so uh, it it baffles me and kind of troubles me. And I'm a little bit shocked that like, you know, that that history isn't more widely known, mm -hmm. that it's like right in the heart of <laughs> the west side of the city. And we don't, what we've got is the relics of these buildings, like the, the you know, community center, the bones in that building are still there. The the um, shopping plaza that had a number of these businesses, the bones of that are still there. And the things that are still kind of actively doing work right now, the fit, the preschool exists. And then there's this Iron Man statue that stands in the, the little kind of square at the center of that community that still is there. Um, you know, so I, I think, you know, the specter of like Fifth City is is right there, you know, and uh, we're in this incredibly, I think one of the reasons that uh, I really turned to uh, the project was 
in my in my work in the parks, I was just seeing so much energy um, in really concentrated neighborhood specific areas where like residents were gathering and beginning to like build uh, new kinds of coalitions and um, ways of like, you know, thinking about like, nobody's gonna save us. We have to do the work for ourselves if we want things to get better. And to me, that was very much parallel with the history of Fifth City. So wanted to bring that bring that up now, you know, to be in conversation with the things that are happening and say, you know, in Inglewood with like rage or, um, you know, its counterpart that started up on the West side with raw or, you know, any number of organizations that are doing that work. You can on North Lawndale, you know, um, I think it's important to, um, to register that history and that not, it's not too, it's not even old history, you know what I mean? It's, it's relatively contemporary. <laughs> so I uh, wanted to, to bring that to the fore. Um, so in terms of the stories that are available at Fifth City, so we have the archive, um, we have your personal you know, story, your personal narrative and experience with Fifth City. Um, is there... Are there sort of residents there who are sort of still maybe, I, I don't know, telling that story or, or kind of, you know, injecting that narrative into the current conversation? Or what, what is the, how, do, how, does, how does Fifth City live on um, beyond? Mm -hmm. So um, I was invited to um, bring the work to the First Church of the Brethren, which is uh, right on the kind of corner on the tip of, you know, the the kind of demarcated area that, you know, is the boundaries of what uh, Fifth City was. So uh, that church is right off the corner of kind of Central Park and Congress, uh, just right, right Um And so that small church small con congregation um, has kind of welcomed the work uh, into their fold. And we've been planning for the past uh, four or five months as a as a group, um, and I think they're very much interested in um, you know how that how they can activate um, that church in the neighborhood uh, more and uh, help you know kind of partnering to do some of that work. Um, you know that the that preschool is still there, uh, continuing its work. Um, I've talked to a number of people who weren't necessarily uh, connected with fifth that you know this fifth city, um, and in, in particular, I was talking to one resident who's like built a whole framework for storytelling off of that um, off of that statue, you know, and thinking about, but very much again in line with the principles of what Fifth City was as a movement, you know, in terms of like deriving strength from those symbols, uh, or, you know, a symbol like the Iron Man and uh, thinking about it as a measure of kind of self reliance and uh, the um, kind of uh, coalition building and um, action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm very much still, you know, like, you know, COVID happened and kind of just knocked us all out in terms of like gathering, but I'm very much interested in gathering more stories, right? Yes. The, um, you know, part of what the work is meant to be uh, as a community uh, generative project is, you know, to have the, the performance at this church, but then to also have an, uh, a several weeks of uh, different kinds of programming, everything from kind of talks and discussions to workshops and uh, opportunities to fellowship over food in which, you know, we just gather people to tell stories, to kind of talk about um, the efforts that individuals or small organizations might be making as, as their own interventions right now. Mm -hmm. And to kind of increase that network of kind of visibility of awareness you know, um, within that community and perhaps in the greater West side, you know, um, to think about, you know, how can there be uh, more ways to 
share the knowledge, the resources, the uh, awareness of, you know, similar things that are happening that might be able to um, leverage together to do something greater. You know, um, I, I'm thinking very, you know, very much of the, the work as a platform to bring visibility to other things that are happening right now. Mm -hmm. And so um, I know that that uh, one of my initiatives that I joined, you know, a, a couple of years back, maybe in 2017, um, uh, Westside Historical Preservation Society was doing their Juneteenth gathering. Um, I, I didn't end up staying on the planning committee, but I was on some early conversations. So um, I'm, I'm just interested in um, You've talked about the the archive the, the stories there and just kind of you know it being a story that's overlooked or you know undertold. Um, so, is there is there a conversation in any sort of way or any overlapping conversation around that sort of historical preservation society or or just you know I I know that there's been conversations in Austin about you know them needing a sort of history museum and then uh, WSHPS you know was uh, talking about some things and apparently there's already a West Side Preservation, West Side, well, actually, there, there's there's another uh, uh, historical preservation society that's largely the, the Jewish history. So I'm just wondering about the sort of engagement oh. history throughout the sort of fabric of the West Side. No, we have not been connected with them, but I would love to be. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, one of the you know, the, the two major things that have come up over and over again with that, the planning committee in terms of, you know, I wanted to, do, to very much be a, a group kind of imagining of like, what should surround this performance, right? If the performance is around these things, then what, what should the programming or gathering or activations be about? And the main things that people talked about were like, you know, um, uh, kind of being a beacon or uh, a space to uh, kind of broadcast the things that are happening now and the energy is happening now. And then also this kind of concern with documenting, preserving, archiving West Side history, you know. And so um, the things that I was tapping into or, you know, with the the a lot of the collaborators that are part of the work is just you know the part the oral history like we're having a an extended exhibition as part of the work um and uh one of my uh collaborators vitali who is uh an urban planner and illustrator by trade um has you know built like the first kind of small exhibition of archive materials that was part of the first work and has really we went back into the fifth city's archives um and, and a lot more. Series and short testimonials or uh, stories from you know residents now, so that that is part of you know what we're collecting um, to to tell those stories and make them present, um, but also reaching out to um, Skyla Hearn and her group of um, uh, archivists and research librarians who call themselves the Blackivists. Um, and they worked with us as part of the Chicago Black Social Culture Map to do the community archiving component of that work, wanting to bring, you know, invite them in to um, kind of do, you know, some of those sessions as part of this project that we could, you know, kind of bring in the scanners and all of that. And invite folks to bring in their own personal archives to uh, learn how to better, you know, keep that material so they, they preserve it uh, for themselves and their families. Um, and then perhaps, you know, share it as part of the, the growing, increasing the archives of the stories that we're telling about Fifth City and the greater West Side. Um, but I would, you know, I'm, I'm definitely looking for other connections. So, you know, I would love the, the uh, organizations you mentioned uh, to be able to reach out to them too. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, happy to make those connections. Um, <laughs> Fifth City, a was was what was the tagline? Sort of human development. It was their human centered development. Yeah, human -centered yeah. Development. Um, so, 
what can Fifth City tell us about our current, um, I mean, whether it's this sort of very current, you know, COVID thing, or just sort of our current context um, more, more broadly? Um, what, can, what does Fifth City have to tell us, you know, about where we are now and where we could be going? Yeah. I mean, I think in many ways from the positive side, it's, it's a, just an affirmation of what people are doing, right? That like that small centered uh, engagement, the, the one-to-one, you know, people to uh, person to person uh, contact and uh, engagement is, is critically important. Right, like getting together in these smaller groupings to kind of share ideas, um, talk about the challenges, create solutions, um, is both where I think we reach the maximum potential for uh, making change, but it's also quite pragmatically, you know, how we can hear people, you know, enough that the frequency, you know what I mean? Of like really being, being able to think deeply with other people. Um, the fact that they worked, I thought it was so you know smart of their, um, their method that it was, you know, the idea of that fifth city was originally 16 blocks and that even within that 16 blocks, they had to break that down into much smaller, uh, engagements to get people to really, you know, think together about what their challenges and what the solutions could be, right? And even how to do the work together. Um, I think um, a number of their kind of what they call their presuppositions are just, are, they're just, they apply now. Like the idea of, you know, that symbols and um, creative, uh ways of thinking about um, our situation and who we are imagining that is really important, right? We need to tell stories. We need to have adornment. We need to, you know, um, yeah, you know, that, that, that creativity is really important as well. Um, and then I think this idea of like, you can't, uh, you can't separate problems, right? Like, that you have to be able to um, deal with or see all of these challenges together, right? And think about how one is affecting another and how do we solve them? How do we create a, a master plan that tries to solve them together, right? Um, is, is critically important. And I think we know that. <laughs> and we just need to be reminded um, that that's how we do the work, right? Um, and so I think that all of that is what the movement uh, can tell us. Um, I think even in its, if you want to call it a failure, you know, that it ultimately didn't, um, you know, that that community is is in very much in a state of, you know, disinvestment and um, in need of love and revitalization, you know, uh, but just that that, you know, goes in cycles and that it's not done, you know, and that the, that there's a new energy and that people are ready to, um, take that on. Um, and that hopefully we're in a, I think, you know, part of one of the things that, you know, did that, uh, movement inequities were that much greater than all the energy they were putting out. And it, you know, maybe we're at a point in time in which we've gathered, you know, we can gather enough steam and resources and energy to um, push past those things, you know, um, or to force force those, the, that system to reckon and um, get right, you know? So, yeah. Well, so the, the Ujima Hour is not out to make news or anything, but, you know, um, I, I, I was doing some uh, cooperative housing, you know, education uh, events in Garfield Park, and I did run across one pastor who had, you know, I won't say a negative opinion, but, you know, did feel um, like the ecumenical society abandoned um, the sort of last iterations of the project. So uh, have you heard that story? Is that something that, you know, one of the challenges that you might highlight as sort of the, that, that. Yep. 
Okay. Yeah, I think we're going to we're going to tussle with, you know, the idea of like yeah, was it was it right to leave? You know, I I think in my discussion with the archive about um, you know, um having a that they that they come in to help support uh, the creation of a process that the community can then move through and take over, but it is their intention not to leave, right? That the that they are helping to support and identify community leaders and help them get what they need to do the work, and then you know their role is to step back. Um, and so I I. I see that, but I also see that ultimately, you know, uh, you know, what, what would have happened if they had stayed? I, you know, I don't know. You know, um, I think though that um, it's really interesting to look at their their the, the Ecumenical Institute, what it, which has become the Institute of Cultural Affairs, that they have had all of the, the these evolutions that are based off of that model. Right, that model is the grand center, the you know, the what all of these other things grew out of, right? And they've just kind of followed those learnings around the world, setting up a number of projects around the globe that followed that model, um, and then also creating a kind of facilitation method that is about building consensus that I'm quickly learning is a part of like a bunch of different institutions here in the city, right? Everything from LISC um, uses those methods uh, to, um, there's a, a Chicago sustainability network that they're part of that is, you know, um, so like it's still giving, it's still bearing fruit, right? It might not look like that, you know, that community Right, that brick and mortar fifth city community, but like those learnings, those ideas have rippled out and are still m making an impact, you know. Um, yeah, but I won't deny that, like, you know, there's a part of me that is sad that they didn't stay, but yeah, yeah. And what would have that, what might have that, might that have brought? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, and yeah. I, I can certainly confess that, you know, um, it, it's I, I I am surprised how often I just kind of trip over something that, you know, is connected to the ICA or connected to this sort of this legacy and this history. I am a member of the Chicago Sustainability Leaders Network. I do yeah. people who've taken the technology or participation training. Right. I do know someone who stays at, you know, the Praxis Collaborative, which is housed in the ICA presently. Um, you know, co-op housing. And so, yeah, you know, there's, there's all these overlaps that, you know, exist. Um, yeah. Right. So, yeah. so um, what do you want folks to, well, well, one, you know, we did not celebrate that um, you, you, your, your goal on three arts, you know, so I mean, yeah. right into that, right? <laughs> uh, so you hit, you hit your number, you know, we got the three arts funding. Um, you know, we got the process um, underway of the community planning. What, what, what are, I mean, I guess, how are you kind of slowly creeping forward now as you know, we're in this digital space and, and um, kind of negotiating that challenge? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think most presently right now, we're just, you know, I'm, I'm meeting with that uh, planning group uh, bi-weekly and, um, or bi-monthly, and uh, we're... That's the same thing, but um, we're constantly assessing like what what's happening now. How is it changing? What you know, we we've we pushed the dates to late June, mm -hmm. um, but you know I don't know. June might not be possible, and we have a second window that's early September. But I don't know if September is possible. You know, for like you know larger gatherings. So I think you know even if we have to push the live engagement to 2021, it will happen, right? But I do want to think about if that happens, if we have to kind of delay that, I want to figure out how we can go ahead in virtual space and kind of, you know, preview that with maybe some of these conversations that that, that are planned to be part of 
um, that two weeks of programming. So whether that's, you know, gathering um, some of the things that are meant to be part of that programming or like gathering uh, 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 urban planners of color to talk about like, you know, um, wealth now and um, how can urban, how can we talk both about critiques of urban planning and, you know, progressive uh, ways of seeing urban planning in the present moment and who does that work and um, who gets to represent communities in that, in that planning work and how can we involve communities voices in that work. So it, maybe some of those things could happen in a virtual space before they happen live, you know, maybe we could do some of the gathering of these testimonials and stories and, and share that archive, um, you know, before we are in, in that live space together. I, you know, I'm not sure what that's gonna take, what form it's gonna take, but I know that we're gonna actively be thinking about it. And um, if we can't go live in June, you know, creating something that some aspect I mean, um, we can keep that energy going. Yeah. And I do see, my hope is that this relationship with First Church of the Brethren through this project, that this is like the beginning of something, not just the realization of this project and moving on, but that uh, we, we imagine what that could be beyond um, this project and continuing with the, the energy of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And what, and so so then, so now we can can conclude. So what would you like to leave folks with on a note of cultural stewardship or uh, connected with Honeypot or whatever, whatever is, is on your drop? <laughs> what nugget, you know, what jewel will you leave us with um, as we conclude this uh, interview? <laughs> um, you know, yeah, I, I guess, you know, we're still, we're out here doing things, uh, even in this space. So uh, Honeypot has a project called If Then that is thinking about um, spirituality and its connections with making creative choices. So we've been building kind of a, working with some other artists and building um, a kind of divining method to make creative choices together and then playing the creative scores that uh, come out of those uh, divining uh, sessions. So uh, I would say look out for some of that work will uh, be coming uh, on the on the internets um, in uh, April and May. Uh, we'll be beginning to share some of that work. So I'd say look out for that. Um, and uh, you know, look out for the Fifth City work in whatever version it comes to us first, whether it's digital or live. But I'm very excited about um, those conversations and that way of communing. Um, and I guess I would just, yeah, on in that vein, like you know, to really think about the importance of um, you know arts and creativity as uh, these spaces for. Um, imaginative, transformative thinking and solution creation and uh, ways of, another way of kind of building coalition and um, yeah, solutions that are just from, you know, um, a multi-body source of, of ideas and, and, and uh, yeah, so. Um, I, yeah, I would, I would, I would leave it with that. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Make sure you let us know what, what the Honeypot website is. What's that? Uh, honeypotperformance.org. Absolutely. Visit honeypotperformance.org. See Honeypot Performance on Facebook, Fifth City Project, or revisit it on Facebook. Are they both? Fifth, Fifth City, uh, <laughs> I think it's Fifth City Project <laughs> on Facebook. Yeah. Yes. Get it. And Instagram, Fifth Dot City, yeah. Absolutely, yep. yeah. So, so get at it on get at it on uh, Facebook, on Instagram. Visit the Honey Pot Performance website. Um, dig into the project. Um, lots of you know rich, rich and inviting work that that comes from the Honey Pot Performance, um, and you know, and, and is shared amongst the mind of Meta and the collaborators that she put together. Uh, so we really appreciate uh, the opportunity to engage with you in this interview today. Um, I am also very realistic about the, the fragility of the archives in this conversation because I've been troubleshooting sound issues. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll see what happens, you know, what I can pull from this tape. But 
you know, okay. it's been a, a wonderful conversation. And I thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mike. I want to get you involved, too, in the, the Fifth City work, though. So, I'm a, you know, I'm going to stay after you about that. <laughs> yes, we, sh we shall be in that conversation as ongoing as it, as it will be. Okay. All right. Well, have a good night. All right. You as well now. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, folks. Um, this was a crazy broadcast um, because I I am not sure um, how much of my audio got captured and, you know, what got lost in the process. Um, I'll have to live with it. So, you know, that's that's all that's all it is. Um, I'll have to live with, you know, what what was lost in the process. Um, but hopefully, hopefully um, a sufficient amount was captured um, and a meaningful amount. I am fairly certain that I got the, the last uh, 40 minutes of that interview um, did go through the audio. But the, the first um, 15 or so minutes of the interview, um, there was some issue with the Skype transmission. So um, if I can salvage it, you know, I certainly will. And I will post it up on Facebook, um, you know, independent of the original um, live, live feed. Um, but, you know, uh, before I go, um, I do have to let you know um, that we have a full schedule, you know, up this year. So finally, you know, I mean, it took me a, a bit of time to actually get this schedule together. But, you know, um, as soon as this sort of COVID broke and I, I got over my, my, my year of grief, um, I had an opportunity to, to do some inv direct invitations and get folks lined up. So, you know, next month we'll be talking to Allende Jean Baptiste um, of Drum Language in DuSable City. Um, in uh, June, we've got Lasaya Wade of Brave Space Alliance. July, we've got Elizabeth Carter, um, formerly of Urban Cooperative Enterprise Legal Center. Um, we've got uh, in August, uh, Gregory Jackson, Sustainable Economies Law Center and Repaired Nations. Um, uh, in uh, September, Bianca Shaw of Tribe out of Atlanta. Um, October, Eric Jackson of Black Yield Institute. Um, in, in November, Malikia Johnson, uh, who who went on a tour, take care of each other world tour, um, you know, and, and had actually some very similar conversations. Um, and then in December, uh, Alita Torre, a parable of the sower, intentional um, cooperative, um, intentional community cooperative, pardon me. Um, so really, really packed schedule, you know, coming um, at, at the, uh, up towards the end of this year. Um, and I finally will tell you um, about uh, Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. Uh, so, as you all know, uh, I am a co-facilitator in that space, right? Um, Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group is a gathering of folks who are intentional about the study or an intentional gathering of folks who are engaged in the history of black, um, the black tradition of cooperatives. Um, so we, we started with doc Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimbard uh, way back in 2018, but we didn't stop there. Uh, we kept going. We kept going through Jackson Rising. We kept going through Grace Lee Boggs, The Next American Revolution. We kept going through the North Country Cooperative Foundation um, uh, Cooperative Curriculum, Collecting Ourselves. Um, and we are continuing to go on um, in this process of really thinking through what are cooperative strategies that can work for our communities now, uh, both for the purposes of, of employment and, and, uh, and generating income, but also really for the employment of co-governance, you know, co-governance strategies inside of our communities, uh, collective and cooperative ownership strategies um, that can, can manage multiple types of, 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 of assets and, 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 and functions in our community essentially trying to design from the bottom up, from the neighborhood level, communities that actually can meet our needs um, on a broad level and that have, again, that broad structure of governance where lot, all of the stakeholders in the community have input and have, 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 uh, have investment and engagement in the processes um, of, of, um, of these businesses, of, of, of real estate uh, holdings, you know, for cooperative housing, um, of all of these spaces. So, um, Cooperation, Liberation, Study, and Working Group. Our next session um, is going to be coming up this uh, this Sunday. Um, so this Sunday being, you know, because I have uh, no conception of the date, um, this Sunday being um, uh, April 19th. Um, so check with us on um, April 19th um, from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. We uh, You can find that on Facebook because we'll be doing an online meeting via Zoom. 
Um, and, you know, and, and when we can finally get outside again, we'll be back to our regularly scheduled in-person gatherings at the breathing room. Um, but, you know, for now, uh, get on Facebook, Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. You can find the Zoom details there in the meeting. Um, and uh, until until then, until the, the next month, um, when we come back to talk to Allende Jean Baptiste, um, I, I bid you peace. I bid you cooperation. Uh, I bid you uh, autonomy, um, inspiration, um, and all of those sorts of things. Until then, have a good evening, folks. All right.